In Supreme Court Justice Holmes' famous metaphor about a crowded theatre, who decides what constitutes a fire? Holmes, after all, used that metaphor to justify the imprisonment of a socialist who was distributing flyers condemning the draft during the First World War. In Holmes's mind, criticising government policy was the same as deliberately causing a stampede and a fire to cause harm. So he reasoned that opposing the draft during a war was too dangerous to be protected speech. It was an absurd comparison. But absurd, absurd comparisons are common in free speech cases. In the Andrew Bolt case, the lawyer for the light-skinned Aborigines described Bolt's columns as akin to eugenics. This kind of thinking led to the Nuremberg race laws. The Holocaust started with words and ended with violence. As history, that is not true. There were significant restrictions on speech, particularly Nazi speech, during the Weimar Republic. But its purpose was obvious, to massively overstate the consequence of mere words. Just words. As Voltaire said once, if a country's religion is sacred, a hundred volumes written against it will do no more harm than that done to rock-solid walls by a hundred thousand snowballs. How can a few black letters on paper destroy it? Every restriction that our governments place on free speech is based on a basic assumption that words are powerful. They can harm, they can manipulate minds, they can create havoc, and some seem to argue these days, destroy democracy itself. But these restrictions assume that A, words have extraordinary power of persuasion, and B, people are ignorant automatons credulously sucking up everything they hear. It appears that these assumptions are widely held, if not quite acknowledged. No one wants to say that speech needs to be restricted because people are idiots. But how else to describe, for example, plain packaging on cigarettes? Logos and colours, so many argue, are so deviously manipulative that they eliminate free will and make a mockery of individual choice. That's an easy one, admittedly. But in the United States, where the First Amendment is increasingly applied to commercial speech, the courts have struck down bans on alcohol advertising, prescription advertising, and tobacco advertising. In 2011, a US federal judge even ruled that regulations requiring graphic warnings on cigarette packets would not stand up to First Amendment scrutiny. But in Australia, we are not so protective of speech. The assumption that people are easily misled, however, by powerful words presents more challenges to social democrats and supporters of regulation than they perhaps realise. Maybe people are easy to manipulate. Maybe they are stupid. Maybe they are credulous and ignorant. But the basic principle of democracy is that they are not. That they have, at the very least, the capacity to participate in the election of their representatives. One commentator wrote in the 1940s that the democratic philosophy is based on man's ability to reason, to decide for himself in his own best interest. It's based on man's educability and his conscience. Censorship denies all these premises. Regardless of the issues of truth and falsehood or the danger of obscenity, free expression is invaluable for progress. Censorship, he concluded, cannot be justified in a democracy. That's the democratic argument, but there's one more central way in which freedom of speech is a vital aspect of the modern world, and if not one of the most critical, central aspects of individual liberty. Both the Athenians and the ancient Romans had ideas about freedom of speech. In both cases they were flawed, but they got at one essential point. A free individual was one who had freedom to speak, and without that freedom to speak, one was by definition not free. No government can control the thoughts of those who they govern. The advocates of religious toleration knew this very well. One pagan public official appealed to a Christian emperor with this argument. A king cannot compel his subjects in everything. But there are some matters which have escaped compulsion and are superior to threat and injunction. For example, the whole question of virtue and above all reverence for the divine. And it is necessary for whoever intends that they should exist naturally to take the lead in these good things, having realized most wisely that the impulse of the soul is unconstrained and is both autonomous and voluntary. Autonomous and voluntary are the keys to the development of freedom of speech. Classical opponents of religious persecution 
claimed that God did not give any person the power to police the thoughts of other people. So they reasoned, he did not mean for monarchs to enforce religious uniformity on their subject. subjects. Everyone has an inalienable right over his own thoughts, wrote Spinoza. The step from freedom to hold an opinion to freedom to express that opinion is not large. The liberty to think is curtailed if it is not grouped with the liberty to discuss or to express the contents of our thoughts. Although he was not a supporter of natural rights, John Stuart Mill provides a crucial argument here. The formation of opinion is richer when one can hear all argument freely, when discussion is not suppressed by censors. To censor, to, refrain freedom of speech, uh, to restrain freedom of speech is to stifle intellectual development and repress the basic moral autonomy of free individuals. Everyone in this room, of course, no doubt opposes some of the most obvious threats to freedom of speech today. So I'm not going to bore you with arguments against the media inquiry or against internet filters. We are instinctively against those attacks on free speech. But in my view, they come down to two, those two basic fallacies. That people are easily manipulated and that words have uncanny power. So let me tackle a more challenging one. One of the oldest restraints on speech is defamation law. In ancient Athens, individuals could bring private indictment for slander against someone who used some prohibited words, shield throw or patricide being some of the most well known. Germanic law in the early medieval period prohibited the insults of wolf, hare, thief or manslayer. The 9th century English king Alfred the Great offered slander as a choice. They could lose their tongue or they could lose their head. The first statute on libel, as it was formulated in England in 1275, protected government officials from embarrassing stories that became public. For a long time, truth was no defense to a defamation act. A libel is no less a libel for being true. This makes perverse sense. A politician's reputation can be damaged by a false accusation, sure, but it will be much more damaged by a true one. Eight centuries later, the law of defamation purports to balance two competing rights. The right to freedom of speech on the one hand, and the right to protect your reputation. That second right is very unclear. After all, reputation is, no, is not much more than the opinions held in everybody else's head. The idea that we have property in the thoughts of others, property being the metaphor that has dominated the theory of reputation, is obviously absurd. From the get-go, this leaves the justification and purpose of defamation law hopelessly vague. Like so many other restrictions on freedom of speech, it's being used as a weapon. In the vicious politics of early 19th century America, partisans were openly advocating using defamation as a weapon to silence or bankrupt political opponents. One early American journalist was the defendant in 60 or 70 private libel suits. Even in 2012, the price of defamation action is central. The cost of defending a defamation lawsuit can be enormous, enough to silence someone's speech. As a consequence, strategic defamation action is an increasingly common weapon to intimidate or harass critics. There is, after all, an enormous disparity between those who have the resources to bring defamation actions and those who are likely to be harmed by defamatory speech. Wealthy individuals have the money to sue their critics, but they also have the money to defend their reputations in the court of public opinion. Less wealthy individuals can do neither, are more likely to be defendants in defamation cases, and are unlikely to have the resources to defend a case through the verdict, regardless of the merits of their defense. The Australian test for defamation is unpretentious. Speech is defamatory if it will damage someone's reputation in the eyes of an ordinary, reasonable people, person. This seems simple, but is rife with ambiguities. Surveys consistently show that people assume others are more intolerant than they are. Australians are actually, though, more tolerant, less easily manipulated, and more skeptical than defamation law allows. One scholar has written that the paradox is that, in our collective imagination, the ordinary reasonable person emerges as a censorious bigot, quick to condemn, slow to question, open to insinuation, closed to reason. Defamation laws assume that words are powerful and that all listeners are gullible. But, as we would argue using the old cliche, the solution to bad speech is more speech. 
In the fallout of the Andrew Bolt case, many commentators claimed that it was nothing more than defamation by other means. The Bolt was luckily the, uh, lucky the offended group didn't use defamation rather than the Racial Discrimination Act to go after him. So, the claim made by some is that while there are disturbing provisions of the Racial Discrimination Act, the action would have been fine and dandy if it was a simple matter of libel. But that ignores the deep political dimensions of the case. Bolt is Australia's most prominent conservative commentator. And Jeff Clark, one of those named in his articles, said to the Herald Sun after the case that while the case was based on the articles, there were certainly other ranges of views too numerous to comment. The court victory was, for many, seen as a blow against a public commentator, not as a defense of social cohesion. One of the founders of the Russian radical tradition during the Tsarist regime was a fellow named Alexander Radishchev, who published his book, Journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow in 1790. It was published during the relatively tolerant regime of Catherine the Great, one of the enlightened despots so loved by enlightenment intellectuals. But the book was destroyed and the author condemned to death. In his book, he gives what I think is the definitive argument against speech against prohibiting speech that offends or hurts our moral sensibilities. He writes, The censorship of what is printed belongs property to so properly to society. Leave what is stupid to the judgment of public opinion. Stupidity will find, will find a thousand censors. The most vigilant police cannot check worthless ideas as much as a disgusted public can. To defend freedom of speech is not to assert that words cannot be cruel or that speech cannot be mean. But it is to acknowledge that to restrain speech is to assert power where no power can exist in individual thought and conscience. Thank you. That is my lecture. <laughs> um, we have uh, 10 minutes, if you don't mind, uh, uh, staying to be uh, uh, quizzed. The um, appropriate term for it. Any questions for uh, for Chris? Um, not so much related to your lecture, but uh, in the world of LDP policy development, um, it just takes time to develop a policy that you probably test and so forth. Every time I read an IPA work, I just think, well, we could just steal pretty much everything the IPA writes and make it policy. Um, Feel free. <laughs> is there some uh, avenue where we can do that regularly in terms of, uh, are there versions of your work which really readily translate to just be a policy document? Is there anything that comes to mind in that space? Be because, because the role, of course, of, of a think tank is quite different, we're not. I actually try to avoid giving too many policy recommendations because I don't think they're particularly useful. Um, uh, with the exception, of course, for the LTP. Um, <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is because whatever realistic or unrealistic idea that we come up with, um, we know that through the political dynamic, none of those things get directly translated. So I was in this discussion uh, last week about drug reform, and everybody wanted to come up with a range of proposals. We're going to spend 100 million dollars on this and all that. That won't get anywhere. That will, uh, it'll be sent through the political machinery, um, a, 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 as it always is. So I don't know whether you recall Ross Garneau talking about um, what he considered to be a beautiful emissions trading scheme that he lovingly um, prepared and presented to, to the political class. A couple of months later, he said, you know, my beautiful system, it's been corrupted by politics. What the hell do you think was going to happen? <laughs> so that, that, that's why we try not to, but, but I, I mean, we'd love to, to, to talk about anything. And I think um, one of the reasons that I talked about freedom of speech today is not just because 